That's the, that's the difference. Both of these will increase light, better distribution of light, on light. Good light. Okay, so the next issue is the twenty-four thousand dollar question. Has been even brought up yet? Yeah, sure. And that is, how much is this event disrupt the uh, sidewalks uh, to put them in? Um, you have to you have to put in wiring. Are you using pre-existing uh, places? What are you doing? Do that's you a good question. Um, I I haven't asked that specific question of the engineers. Um, they do the, all that and goes well, design the, schematics. The residents are going to be disrupted. So. Right. I believe that the existing electrical conduit in the street is adequate. And so the disruption would be when you take out a pole and you put in a new pole, there will be some construction, but I don't believe it's trenching throughout the entire the entire street. I think it's, you know, at so that location. So it's just replacing already existing poles right. and then, right. then the, the the wiring is already underground, so you're not tearing up the whole sidewalk. I'm just trying to imagine right. how much it could be. Right, that is my understanding. I have not asked the engineers that direct question, so I will have to go back and double check that. Um, and then this project doesn't tear up anything, it just adds those lights, and so there's obviously a construction impact as you're taking a new and, hole and then sort of light. Which one uses more electricity? Uh, that I do not know the answer to. Because then there's a cost saving there too for the city. Right. Um, um, that's also an interesting question. Um, I don't know which one uses more or less electricity. So I gave you some well, right now. I mean, I, I think, you know, I don't know, my understanding is I think like both of those options would definitely be an improvement from the existing, from, you know, they will you know, be. a huge improvement right. from what we have existing. You so, are correct. You know, whichever one, like, you know, uses the less, I think it's very minor. I mean, our, our, still our concern, which has nothing to do with the poles, is that uh, this property owner should be placing uh, that good lighting around their properties uh, because they do have enclaves inside their property line right. where people uh, do weird things and can right. jump out at you and whatnot. Right. And then the other thing we have, which is really annoying down here, is that the gates open up into the sidewalk and that's how you get blindsided if you're not paying attention to right. where you're walking. Right. So there's kind of a couple of things going on in this neighborhood that. Uh, Maybe it doesn't happen in some other neighborhoods uh, because of the property lines right, in, right next to the uh, uh, sidewalk. All right. And you've got some tree issues on some of the uh, north-south streets as well that block light as well. Right. So, so the option two covers more territory. Yes. More light for the sidewalks itself because there's a second level of lights. And this will provide a lot of light for the sidewalks too. So. This will just cover more sidewalks. So similar amounts of lights covers more sidewalks. Right. So what is what it would be the advantage of option one other than the, 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 the aesthetics of it? Uh, I mean that is one of the primary benefits, you know, because they all provide adequate or right. increased amounts of light. In order, in order of light. to get aesthetics, we're giving up some territory. Right. And I mean I think part of the idea I've been I've sort of listening to a couple of these conversations is that you know. Um, in the Tenderloin, uh, you've often sort of given up aesthetics in, all, in sort of choices about public ground improvements. Um, and that there were sort of a number of people in the neighborhood and sort of other conversations that I've listened to that are interested in sort of like considering aesthetics now um, as sort of an important kind of s uh, signal to people who are in the neighborhood that, um, that, you know, people care about this neighborhood. They don't just want sort of like, um, the kind of lowest tier and most coverage, but sort of want to go um, for more. And the idea is that if you sort of like push for the higher aesthetic, um, then you go after, sort of the city goes after another chunk of funding to sort of push it out into more territory later. But that you really, you only get a stab at this, um, at putting in one of these, um, you know, what what's the last time lights were, you know, once every, decade or two decades or more, so you're sort of making a choice for a very long term, and you have to imagine sort of the longer term of the neighborhood as you can sort of make a okay. choice. So the question then boils down to just the appearance and sacrifice the space and the appearance. Are there poles like that out there now? Um, there are some poles like this out here. I believe there, I don't know exactly what they are, but there are two blocks that have poles like that. You say people in the neighborhood have, have felt that the aesthetics are more so, so what's important to understand is that even if I didn't come to you today with these two projects, every light 
high pressure sodium light in the tenderloin that would be converted to LEDs. That will increase safety, that will increase lighting, enhance all that. We're also going to do an additional thing on top of that, and that is one of these two options. <coughs> and his comments were all correct. Any other question? Uh, yes? Um, my one concern I have is if you do a centralized area, all you're going to do is push the crime from that area into the areas that you don't do. If you do a larger area, think you could be nice enough to push the crime across Market Street or into <laughs> Central or over in Northern and give it to them and take it out of the neighborhood. Um, whether it's fancy lights or non fancy lights, that's really immaterial. Um, and for the people who live down here on a daily basis, we have to utilize our sidewalks at night. Um, it, I would probably guess people would say, screw aesthetics right now and let's lighten up the streets so we can be safe. Could be bad. Anything else? Don't you want us to take a vote or show a hand? Uh, we're not asking for a formal vote. I'm going to record some of, this, some of these feedback items, but uh, I think I've heard from a lot of folks. Um, and, you know, we're going out and meeting with a lot of groups in the Tenderloin, and this is one of many presentations. Who's making the final decision? Uh, once we um, go back and look at all the feedback, we'll sit down with the mayor's office, with the District 6 supervisor, and make a collective decision. What is the mayor's office position? Oh, we don't have a position. <laughs> I, honestly, we're, we're sort of looking for yeah, input from the community. I mean, I think that that's what it's going to determine in the end. Sort of, so that the DC has been sort of out something all over, giving this presentation all over, and sort of we're trying to listen in wherever we can. Well lit sidewalks are going to encourage foot traffic. Yes. And people are always encouraged to walk where they can. So, I mean, that's would be my vote for more lumens. Okay. So, can you, there, so there won't be any hearings at City Hall? There would just be uh, uh, an internal, uh, there's no hearing about this? Um, I am not see? aware of the current hearing schedule for this this particular project. So, but if there is, can, you, can we be informed about that? Yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, some, if there's any decision, we'd like to know how that process is. And so far, all you mentioned is that there's talks between the two city agencies, uh, and, and that's all great, but eventually uh, the PUC has to approve it out of the sale? Uh, yeah, we are the agency that would do the construction. Uh, but that, but it would probably have to be an agenda item on their board, on their, on their agenda? Um, potentially. I, it depends on where the funding is um, uh, and how that funding gets allocated. Um, so potentially, yes, I don't know where the actual funds are. Well, hopefully the city has it right all right. Is there any other questions? Uh, we move on to the next agenda. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay. okay. Thank, you. thank you. Okay. Uh, all right. We're going to move on to the next presentation. Um, to be here today. We've got a great project down where Bell Street and Market Street and Polk Street meet. 57 uh, Bell Street. It actually has a separate address over on 
Market Street, but it's it's a restaurant that's currently being built. It's, uh, I won't let Jay speak, but he has a restaurant up in Lower Haight that's very popular and well known called Maven. And I think I think Maven, M A C E N. I think in, in those uh, packages, they uh, they got three stars from Bauer in their latest review. Excellent food. Excellent cocktails. Uh, one of the best bartenders in California is they're doing their bar program. And I think this also is going to be a uh, cocktail-centric uh, cocktail uh, lounge and restaurant. However, what they're adding to this is uh, live entertainment, primarily jazz in the lounge. So, yeah, let me tell you a little bit more about the concept. As Mark mentioned, uh, going on to the, the 39th Fell Street, right where Fell, Market, and Polka kind of keep to lie, um, we have secured a large space that's currently under construction. should be done the first week in J J July is our target. Um, we're taking um, some of the, the high energy and successes that we've had at Maven in the Lower Haight, um, bringing some of the operations team and enabling myself to open up this new project. On the Fell Street side of the building, um, is Mr. Tipple's recording studio. Um, to give you the total scope, uh, it's a very large space. On the front side, the building goes all the way through the block, and on the Market Street, that address is technically 1446 Market, um, is going to be a restaurant called Cadence. Both will be functioning in the same building, out of the same kitchen, out of the same licensing. Um, from a concept and from a use, there'll be two different spaces, two different entrances, two different names, two different menus, uh, but one core, both company, and space uh, operating both of those. Getting a little bit more specific about Mr. Tipples, um, the, the core of what we're trying to do is be a craft cocktail bar, um, a great, a clean, safe place to come at night, enjoy a conversation with friends, and the unique add-on is live entertainment. We have building a, um, a small stage for about a three or four piece jazz combo, um, playing a acoustic every night of the week. Um, our goal is to be Again, a lovely bar with entertainment, um, not trying to be one uh, a jazz venue specifically, uh, charging no cover at the door, and then also not trying to be in a nightclub. This is trying to be more of a classic speakeasy with live music in it every night. With that, uh, we are operating under a Type 47 liquor license. Uh, we'll have a food component running until 1 to 30 in the morning as well. Um, what we found at Maven is food just calms the room greatly. Yes, we are serving cocktails. Uh, that is, in some ways, part of our art form and what we do best. Uh, food helps us satiate the stomach, it just slows the experience, and makes it a, a complete experience rather than uh, just a, a bar. Um, also, in that neighborhood, there's very few places that are open uh, that late that can provide energy and vitality, increase foot traffic, um, and provide a complete experience. Um, in some ways, we look most directly to our industry peer, peers of other restaurants downtown who people are getting off work on their way home. Where can they go? It's a place safe, enjoyable, have food, um, still engage in, in nightlife that way. Um, talk about your food operation. Yeah, so Mr. Tibble is actually giving me a small, uh, globally inspired street food, um, very small menu, uh, as Jay said, kind of a menu that will fill people up and kind of slow down that room and, and bring a, a, a little more mellow vibe across uh, across the table. In the restaurant, you're also the chef of the restaurant. Yeah, so the other side, uh, Cadence, uh, the restaurant will be a little bit more um, high-end, progressive, uh, refined uh, American food. Um, a little bit little bit bigger than, than Mr. Tipple's, uh, a little bit larger menu, uh, a little bit more uh, refined, smaller plates, um, kind of like I said, that refined, uh, progressive American style. Price point on the, on the plates and uh, cables? Cadence price points, uh, we're trying not to top out over anything of $35, and um, Mr. Tipples will, will keep under uh, 12 bucks. Questions? So, I, I just don't understand the concept. So we've got a restaurant, a regular restaurant, and the other side, Mr. Tipples, is more of a nightclub music, small menu type of a restaurant. Right? Yes, we're um, firing out of the same kitchen. Um, I believe on page two there's the schematics, and that is kind of showing that 
though we are building the entire space and both opening up a bar and a restaurant as one entity, um, two different uses, two different theme styles in each room, two different entrances, and hence uh, two different names at that one. Casual event for fine dining. Hey. It's kind of like going to Disneyland and walking from Tomorrowland to Never Neverland and walking over to the threshold, and it's two different ideas, two different characters, two different identities, but it's still connected under the same umbrella. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you. What will your hours be? Um, we're operating all six, seven nights. Um, both Cadence and Mr. Tipples will open at 5 p.m. Um, Mr. Tipples works to extend later into the night. Food till 1.30, the last call from the bar at 1.30, uh, and we should shut down promptly at before 2 a.m. So this would be good for the after theater crowd. It's exactly trying to do that. We are going, basically we're one block away from both SF Jazz, uh, mm -hmm. Symphony, as well as the Bill Grandma Auditorium. If we're providing that live music, specifically in that post-show window, these are uh, patrons who are walking around who love live music, just saw a show. Where do you go afterwards? Or where do you go to, to celebrate with your, your date to say, that was a great show, let's talk about it now. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, where's your main entrance? Um, I'm going to come over to point sorry for not big points out. It's on both sides. That's why I'm wondering. <laughs> That's why I'm um, Sorry, that drawing does have, I'm going to say, far more detail than it's kind of necessary to outline it. Um, that is the, the most it could be there. clearer drawing our architects are able to provide for this evening. Thanks for your understanding. What obstacles are you facing? Or this is just ready to go. Um, the general obstacles of just building out a 7,000 square foot restaurant from scratch. <laughs> um, those are kind of the normal. Right, no um, yeah, no, in a very serious way. Um, we are currently in application for our entertainment license uh, from the city, uh, making sure there is support from the neighborhood, um, and namely expressing our intent and goals with that city. That we want to have a place that we can one uh, have a thriving business, employing. Uh, our staff, but also getting um, work and basically employment to the musicians as well. Um, the schedule of music will be rotating all seven nights. We're going to have a stage of four. That means there's going to be at least 28 musicians every week playing and earning an income from this and basically creating a thriving high vitality art scene right here as well. Um, Let's go open in July. Uh, that's the target. You better be the <laughs> So wonderful. Thank you. Uh, a, a, any other questions or Jazz venues 
And the next question I have is, is this just the other questions I've heard in the meeting? So, so 